scientist has a duty to society. He's really being paid to find out what the facts are in a number of different uh, areas. And uh, if he then doesn't uh, tell the public what the facts are, I think he's neglecting his responsibilities. It's one thing a scientist owes society the truth as he sees it. And I don't think he should be frightened from that by reactions by newspapers, media and so on, or uh, ill-advised students and other people who don't want to know. Even a uh, right idea is often, uh, first of all, encounters a good deal of hostility. Remember Galileo or Darwin or any of the famous scientists. Uh, obviously, if you have original creative ideas, they must be novel, and therefore the people who hold the orthodox views, must dislike it and criticize you for it. That's obvious. It always happens. So you have to have a certain degree of um, intellectual courage to keep on with it, regardless of that kind of criticism. He's one of the best known and most prolific psychologists in the world. Hans Eysenck has written more than 70 books, including bestsellers like Know Your Own IQ and Test Your Own Personality. He set up the first department of psychology in London and devised the now famous Eysenck Personality Questionnaire. Yet while he's been a professor for over 30 years, he's become notorious for championing views based, it said, on highly controversial evidence. He He's been condemned as a bigot, as a dangerous maverick, even a racist. While he says he's just presenting the facts, others question whether it's even science. When I started out in science, I felt a bit like a big friendly dog who gets kicked in the teeth uh, because of the reception that uh, original ideas uh, received by other people. I found that many people preferred their illusions to facts and were rather cross when you pointed out that the facts went in agreement with what they were thinking. Isink left Germany at the age of 18. By 39, he was professor of his own department, pursuing a career that has hotly divided critics ever since. I think Hans Isink uh, conforms particularly strongly to, to one type, that is to say, the man who can't lose any step in any argument without feeling that he's lost face. Now, when you get beaten in an argument by somebody who's not politically correct but almost rejoices in being politically incorrect, they hate him, and they hate him for his success and the ease at which he does things. Oh, there's no doubt about it that these critics are um, very often um, arguing from the point of view of uh, ideologies. There's no doubt about it. Um, but in, in science, you can't have two sets of facts that contradict themselves. Either he's right or he's wrong. In 1970, Isaac published his now notorious book on race and intelligence. This interpreted the results of IQ tests taken by white and black Americans. He caused an outcry. Uh, it has been known for 80 years or more that in the United States there are quite marked differences in IQ between blacks and whites, of about 18, 15 points of IQ. And the question really is, uh, what causes it? It used to be taken for granted that the causes were environmental, but the improvement in the state of blacks uh, has never been reflected in any change in IQ. Also, there are a number of experiments to disprove some of the environmental theories. For instance, it isn't true that black children do better on tests as they're tested by blacks and by white uh, testers and so on. Even if you 
take black and white children who are, whose parents are equal in socioeconomic status and who go to the same school, there's still a difference of about 12 points. And so. so really, the only contribution I made was to summarize the evidence and to suggest that this was a very important area in which we simply didn't know the answer. And even that brought down the house on me, as it were, because some people simply didn't want to know uh, about the evidence, about the facts. They wanted everybody to say, sort of on a priori grounds, no, obviously everybody's equal. The, the race and IQ story is, is, is a fairly ugly one. Uh, people who um, normally like to think of themselves as scientists, r rigorous, uh, abandoned all rigor and scientific principle and just started to argue as politicians. And they saw this evidence that, uh, that um, black children weren't benefiting in the way that people had claimed uh, uh, from um, special educational provision and wanted to uh, confront society at large with that body of evidence and wanted to say uh, uh, th this doesn't prove that uh, blacks are inferior, but my God, it suggests it. Uh, and you should take note of that. And many people had that impulse. Uh, I think uh, Isaac succumbed to it uh, pretty fully, uh, but he absolutely wasn't alone. Isaac's work was seized on by the National Front. His suggestion that American blacks might be genetically inferior played into the hands of racial politics. He himself was called a racist. He was attacked at a lecture in London University. In Melbourne, students tried to prevent him from speaking. There were quite a large number of students who in some way uh, seemed to resent that the university had invited me at all and they were beating up some of the people who were trying to keep them away and finally the chairman said well maybe we better stop it and <laughs> didn't feel emotional about it, I thought it was rather odd. The behavior of these uh, very left-wing students was of course very similar to that which I'd encountered in Germany with the the Nazis beat up and uh, disrupted the lectures of socialists and Jewish and other people with whom they disagreed and uh, to find it over here and in Australia was really quite upsetting in a way because we always thought of uh, these countries as a home of free speech rather than this kind of fascist oppression and, uh, but it happened and uh, I think it was very much a change for the worse. Isaac had actually grown up in Hitler's Germany. There, anti-Nazis lived in fear. My background in Germany produced really maverick mentality because in the school I went to, apart from the Jewish children, all the others practically were Nazi, or at least very conservative and uh, leaning in that direction. I was the only one who was not inclined in that direction and really outspokenly anti-Nazi which could be quite a dangerous sort of thing if I hadn't been the biggest and strongest in the class I might have suffered grievously but then you don't beat up somebody on all the school teams of tennis and uh, football and uh, so on so I managed to get by. Isaac came to London and settled in Herne Hill. His strident public image is not reflected in his suburban private life. At home, and to his family, and to close friends, he is a very gentle soul, actually. He's certainly stable, there's no doubt about that. He's extremely stable, if anything, too stable, because he doesn't see any danger in anything, and he, he needs me to worry for him, really. He's not controversy seeking I don't think no I think what he does is he he causes it by just saying what he, what, he, what he thinks is is right but his personality is um, not like that in private still living somewhere in, in the extreme south it's going to move down into France and then towards the weekend gradually push north towards the extreme southern districts once again I've lived with him for 
many years and I've never known him to be wrong, even though I've wondered sometimes whether what he's saying is correct. But he doesn't stick his neck out, as far as I'm concerned, until he's done so much research, until he's done so much um, work into the background of things that he's absolutely sure. And um, I think he quite welcomes then um, being able to defend that point of view. His defense of his theory on race and IQ, however, affected the whole of the Isink family. It did affect the family, and we had to actually decide whether we were going to, what we were going to do about it, whether we were going to uh, muzzle him, or whether we were going to take some sort of action about it as far as keeping the children out of it. And um, so we felt that what he was saying and what he was doing was Im very important, and we, we just thought we'd divorce the children from that, which we did. We had a, a, a temporary name change, which in fact uh, did protect them, because um, neither the school nor l later on their jobs actually knew the connection. Isaac's theories of race and IQ were part of his wider belief in the importance of heredity. He insisted that a child's intelligence and personality were largely fixed by their genes. The environment they grew up in wasn't that important. I don't see that any parent with more than one child can possibly doubt the importance of genetic factors because siblings can be so very and usually are so very, very different. If I look at my own children, my oldest son is very introverted, my daughter is extremely extroverted. They differ in almost everything you can think of. Uh, and we didn't try to alter their behavior because it was a hopeless thing to try and do anyway. And why should you? Uh, you don't know any better than they do uh, how they should behave or what they're going to be. Uh, so I think differences in children in the same family are very powerful proof of the importance of genetic factors. Most of the controversy, so-called, I've had is rather as if, I, if my little boy said, two and two is five, and I say, no, two and two is four. It's not really a controversy. I'm just putting the facts forward, and pe people who don't like the facts then make a controversy out of it. His sympathizers recognize his many confrontations, but believe they're a result of his simple passion to speak out whatever the personal cost. He doesn't like taboos. He doesn't like the fact that there are certain areas of, of science or certain areas of the world that we cannot investigate. That there's no reason why, if, if there's no reason why we can't investigate human memory, which as psychologists we do extensively, why, why can't we look at racial differences, if we can look at gender differences, if we can look at any other sort of differences, why can't we do this? He doesn't like the idea, no doubt for his own early childhood and experiences, of making certain areas acceptable and others unacceptable for scientific investigation. I think um, he has an extremely strong sense of not wanting to be muzzled or anybody else to be muzzled. He's, he likes freedom of expression for everyone, and it may be because he was brought up in a, in a Germany where you couldn't do that, that he's, he's very strong. And that's why he's in this country, because he, he felt that here you could have freedom of expression. Whatever the reasons, his contentious style has wrecked any chance of the honours he at one time may have expected to win. It's very curious, many people have found it very curious, that he hasn't got a knighthood, that he hasn't got, I think he has one honorary doctorate. Um, I would argue that a man of his stature should have 20, 30 honorary doctorates. There are certainly comparable examples. It seems to me that any form of honour, an academic honour um, or a knighthood or whatever, is very difficult to achieve if you spent your whole life being, in his words, a rebel. And as a consequence, he's paid the price. He's paid the price of making the people who could give him those honours very, very annoyed. It comes as no surprise that people are as divided over his legacy as they are over his ideas. He's been brave enough to say things that other people would not say. He's been radical enough to disagree with consensus. All of these things have meant that he has I think, in many, many areas, been ahead of his times. And that's why his influence will live on for many years to come. I'm not a maverick at all. This is just an impression given by the media because I like to give that kind of impression and because I don't like the facts, or many of the facts, like 
the uh, genetic uh, importance in, uh, in intelligence and personality. They like a kind of egalitarianism and so on, the politically correct, etc. From that point of view, of course, they don't like it, but nevertheless it is a fact of life. And uh, all I'm doing is presenting the facts of life and uh, get clobbered accordingly.